May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable to you, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning. It's been a beautiful weekend, um, and the weather has just been sublime. And I just wanted to say that the gardening season is in full swing at St. John's, and we just spent the last month building raised breads, beds, hauling and preparing soil and mulch, weeding what in fact is a little garden patch so that we can grow organic gardens to share with our food insecure neighbors in the Huntington area. Patch is just a tiny portion of the 17 acre area which the town designated as a community garden in 1972. But to us, it is indeed a huge garden project and many of us working the garden are farming beginners, learning as we go along. In 1989, the garden was named for Robert Kubeka, a former environmentalist with the town's Department of Environmental Protection, and he was also a carting business owner. He saw, oversaw the organic garden from 1973 to 1976, helping residents to grow their own vegetables without pesticides. Now, we meet our gardening neighbors in the hot sun, or in our case, the pouring rain, a friendly lot as we tell them about St. John's, and they give us farming tips and where to get the best deals for seeds and plants. Many seeds of love have been planted in that space. This past Memorial Day, 18 of us from St. John's, ages 7 to 80 or so, converged on this little area previously readied for planting. Three plots, in fact, each about 20 by 30 feet. After a lot of hard work, we discovered they are not so little. But we prayed over that space and spent six hours planting tomatoes, green beans, corn, squash, lettuces, cucumber, garlic, eggplants, and lots of fresh herbs. We also planted some sunflowers to smile at us each time we spent time in that space. And we also planted some marigolds to keep the bugs at bay. Now we water and wait, wondering if the plants will grow and thrive. Each day, one of our many volunteers goes over to water and watch the growing process. Although, can you imagine watching plants grow? Probably like watching a slug cross the street. Nevertheless, sitting in the middle of all that growth potential can be incredibly peaceful and meditative. What a special space to go to, to, to be in prayer and to just simply be with God. We hope for a full and healthy harvest offering from modest beginnings, we pray for and envision a yield that will feed many. Of course, there are many factors that can affect the growth of our seedlings, like diseases or poor soil preparation, storms that flood our little area. We wonder, will the ground be able to absorb all that water, or will it ruin our precious babies? Before we stepped out in faith to begin our own garden, many of us naively believed, or maybe I should say I believed, <laughs> that plant growing was a simple and straightforward process. You know, easy peasy. <laughs> the plantings we hear about in today's lessons open a window into God's kingdom. Through the use of parables and metaphors, we receive simple yet profound messages in a more complex way. Seeds in the Gospel of Mark bear fruit metaphorically. Trees provide all kinds of branches for birds and shade for people, the people of Ezekiel. The beginning of transformation begins with something small, a seed or a sprig. Ezekiel was a prophet who, along with his Israelite brothers and sisters, was among the first group to be deported to Babylon in 597 BCE. Eleven years later, Jerusalem and its temple was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar, and another deportation occurred. And finally, in or around 582 BCE, a third deportation occurred. 
Although the Jews suffered greatly in exile and faced powerful cultural pressures, they maintained their national spirit and religious identity. Elders supervised the Jewish communities, and Ezekiel was one of several prophet, prophets who kept alive the hope of one day returning home. He used the metaphor of the great cedar tree to paint a picture of what in fact had happened to them, why they were in captivity. He had already prophesied that his nation would be destroyed because of the arrogance of its leaders who believed they could do anything they wanted, all on their own. They didn't need God. Hence, according to Ezekiel, Jerusalem is destroyed and they find themselves in exile. They had forgotten their place in relationship to God. Ezekiel continues his prophecy proclaiming, All the trees of the field shall know that I am God. I bring low the high tree, and I make high the low tree, and I dry up the green tree and make the dry tree flourish. Exact opposites of what we might think. God is telling the Israelites through Ezekiel that the, a remnant of the tree of Israel will be preserved. A tiny tender sprig. I looked that up. You know, they can grow. It'll be planted on a high and lofty mountain so that it may produce boughs and bear fruit and become a noble cedar. Under it, every kind of bird will live, and in the shade of its branches will nest winged creatures of every kind. All the trees of the field shall know that I am God. Israel will survive, but in a new and repaired relationship with God. God would restore the way of justice and mercy to this renewed nation so it could be a blessing and beloved community for all people, the weak, meek, the poor, and the lowly. All peoples far and wide will know that I am God and live together in my kingdom. Now all that sounds very lovely, Trees growing, birds nesting, but this passage is actually pretty political. There's that word, politics. <laughs> we hate to even consider that word in today's charged atmosphere, so let's break the code a bit. The sprig of the cedar to be planted is someone to be king from the line of David. The mountain is Mount Zion in Jerusalem. The tree is like the tree of life from Genesis, in which birds of every kind can nest. That is, for all people, Gentiles and Jews, enemies and friends. And the high tree is to be brought low. That is, the powerful are to be humbled and the low tree high. The poor and the oppressed are to be honored. The passage from Ezekiel about a tree and a mountain is indeed revolutionary, and so are Jesus' parables about the realm of God the revolutionary and in code. God promises that this tiny sprig will become a noble cedar, a tiny shoot symbolizing strength and resilience for God's people. The grandeur of this cedar can and will offer hope for the inclusivity of God's creation. All people will dwell under the protective branches, branches of God's grace, suggesting the universality of God's love and protection hope for Israel then, and a promise for all of us who now live in relationship with God. It reminds me a bit of a, a Navajo weaving of the tree of life. Um, and while I don't actually own a, a weaving, they're, they're expensive, but imagine the time and love that goes into weaving them. When we were in Arizona and we spent time with Reverend uh, Debbie Royals, who was the canon uh, for the Native American ministries, we saw artwork uh, that depicted the tree of life with birds. Beautiful imagery to remind us that all peoples everywhere are welcomed under its cooling branches. There's a hymn that I love, and it's written by Marty Hogan. Some of you may know it. It's called All Are Welcome. Its message is so relevant as we continue to join our brothers and sisters in solidarity during this Pride Month as we celebrate Juneteenth coming up in our ongoing fight for human rights and equality for all. And I dare say it's just as pertinent as we continue to pray for peace, love, and acceptance of all peoples throughout our war-torn world. 
Here are the first two verses. Let us build a house where love can dwell and all can safely live. A place where saints and children's tell, children tell how hearts learn to forgive. Let us build a house where prophets speak and words are strong and true, where all God's children dare to seek to dream God's reign anew. So today's gospel took place some 600 years later in Ro a Roman-occupied Israel, where once again the rich are getting richer and the poor were oppressed and, vul and the vulnerable were neglected. How easy we forget. God's way of compassion and justice had been abandoned. Jesus called people to shift their allegiance from the materialistic, hard-hearted Caesar and Herod back to the spiritual, merciful, and loving way of God. A radical and revolutionary message, just like that of the prophets who had gone before him. Jesus had a heart for the weak and vulnerable, the poor and the outcast. He healed the sick, the disabled, and restored people to sanity. Jesus, however, couldn't deliver his message directly because in his day, the power to forgive and declare people healed rested with the temple priests. Jesus was clearly usurping their power, so parables became his method of choice. Parables challenge our thinking along, along with the way we imagine things ought to be. They intentionally interrupt what we believe we know and confront us with what we may not yet need to learn. Perhaps they deliver an unwanted truth, something we just don't want to hear. Using a parable stimulates our imagination so we can perceive the power and presence of God in a new way, opening the window to our hearts and our minds. Now, Jesus shares stories about seeds and plantings. And like Ezekiel, he explains that the realm of God is likened to a field we plant with seed. And by a power that is not ours, it grows, it sprouts and grows, and, and it's able to bear much fruit. God's realm is like the smallest of seeds that then turns into the greatest of trees. Now in 2024, we understand the science behind seed germination, but isn't it still a wonder to see it happen before our very eyes? And it happen it does, often when we're not looking, actually. Such a delightful mystery. The little seed buried in the darkness of the earth. We scrutinize that soil, just like watching that slug cross the road. And our focus is so much on that deep brown soil that we miss the exact moment when that seed plant emerges. Poof, here it is. And you say to yourself, where did that come from? And at what moment did I miss or blink? Imagine a tiny seed as small as a mustard seed grows into the largest of bushes. The sunflower grows tall and strong and follows the sun, but it starts as a little seed. What are the seeds that we are planting? Jesus tells us God's kingdom is right here in our midst. We are God's seeds. We become the parable. We don't control the process of our own growth or the growth of God's kingdom or the growth of this church. God does all of that, but we are called to allow God to change our hearts, to discern God's call for us. How often do we resist and fight God's call for our own growth and service to God's kingdom because we are afraid Good grief, we might have to change, and we don't like to change. Oh, my goodness. But remember, the seed in our parable was very, very small. Surprise, the mustard seed, the mustard bush is immense by comparison to its beginnings, and we know that the mustard seed isn't the smallest seed in the world, but the bush that it produces is so large, the contrast is what we're looking at. Every time we choose to love instead of lashing out in anger, every act of generosity instead of greed, every time we set aside our own agendas to help another works to further God's kingdom. Every time we engage in practices of Bible study, prayer, and service, we 
are participating in the kingdom of God. We step out, God steps in and uses our small, tiny acts of love to further God's kingdom. Jesus began his earthly ministry with 12, just 12, 12 individuals who were forever confused. Their conviction, though, became energized when they saw that their seeds began to sprout. A movement began. We have the church. The kingdom of God is dependent upon God's grace and upon human initiative. The kingdom of God is like a parish, our parish, who decided to plant a garden, the garden of grace. We talked to our neighbors and found that they wanted vegetables, so we planted a garden and the plants grow. And so do the conversations about the plants and how to care for God's earth. And the conversations sitting in the sun beneath the umbrella at the table in our garden turn to the attention we give to our neighbors and to all workers, no matter who they are. God does have a plan to replant people, and it begins with a small, simple, tender sprig becoming a towering cedar. The power that God has appears in reversals of what we expect or even in upheavals that upset our expectations of how the world should be. Especially in this day, we ask ourselves, how is God at work in our world? Because we surely cannot do this on our own. Yes, the realm of God is like a parish who planted a garden scattered a seed on the ground and which grows we know not how but it is growing god knows how our joining together with god now therein lies our hope and to finish out this hymn of marty hogan's i'd like to sing i hope let us build a house where love is found in water wine and wheat a banquet hall on holy ground where peace and justice meet. Hear the love of God through Jesus is revealed in time and space as we share in Christ the feast that frees us all are welcome.